You're listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. And we're doing Convenience Matters at the Nax Show with our 23, 24,000 closest friends. We'll figure out what that final count is. My name is Jeff Leonard. I'm with Nax. And I'm Carolyn Schneer, also with Nax. And we're joined today by David Portolatin with the NPD Group. Thank you for joining us. Hey, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. David, you've been presenting here at the NAC show in, a, in an educational session, and we've worked for years and years, um, and you've done some fantastic research, and we've worked together about channel blurring and disruption. Um, tell me some of the trends that you're seeing in America that convenience retailers can, can learn from. Well, you know, the retail landscape today is just being incredibly disrupted, uh, not just in convenience, but really across the, the total landscape. In fact, uh, um, I'm fortunate that at our company we study about 17, 18 different industries and all told it represents about $1.8 trillion in consumer spending. That $1.8 trillion spend is actually declining by about a percentage point year over year. So um, it's not just um, this specific industry, it's consumer brick and mortar activity in total is just uh, being heavily disrupted. So, you know, what, what I talked to guys here about yesterday was, um, you know, what do you do? How do you reinvent what happens with inside the four walls of that box to make it uh, more resistant to some of these disruptive things that are happening out there? Uh, we talked about everything from uh, curating a unique assortment that's targeted to a specific customer that, you know, is your kind of core audience uh, to really leveraging uh, your brand partners to showcase uh, some of the best of what they do in a unique way or in a way that's maybe different from the guy across the street uh, or, or down the road uh, to, you know, really embracing this digital revolution. There's no reason why convenience retailers, look, the, the big problem in um, uh, e-commerce right now is this idea of last mile delivery. Well, the convenience store is right there in your neighborhood already. So maybe there's a role to play in convenience retail uh, to embrace this whole digital revolution and, and be one of the center points of it, not just sit back and, and, and lose traffic as more people shop from home. And really, when you look at, you're talking about, you look at all these different food channels. We, we won't ask you which one's your favorite, but you know, I'm sure he'll say convenience. <laughs> but really, everybody sells food. It's, it's grocery stores, it's clothing stores. Uh, you think about the landscape just in a generation or so. Could you imagine 40 years ago going to Montgomery Wards and getting food? Yet That's people right. go to Walmart, Target as their first option for food. Well, and everything's convenient today. So uh, a couple of things are happening. One, one is as uh, traditional brick and mortar retailers face these these difficult circumstances out there, one of the things that they're turning to to become a more experiential retailer is add food and beverage. I'm told that in some Bloomingdale stores now there's a bar in the men's department. You know, how do you get men to shop for menswear? I guess you put a bar uh, in, in there. But all of those things are, are food and beverage occasions that at some level are competitive with uh, traditional convenience stores. Um, the other thing that's happening is Convenience is more important than it ever has been. That hasn't changed. That never will change. But the way the consumer today um, accesses convenience has changed. So we went through a 30-year period or so um, in, in America where aging baby boomers or, or baby boomers coming of age were starting families. Uh, they were focusing on careers. They had dual incomes. We had an increasing percentage of women in the workforce. And so it created this demand for convenience. And, and they accessed that convenience in the form of uh, shortcuts in the food, you know, packaged foods, processed foods. And, and the ultimate inconvenience is let's have somebody cook the food for us. So the restaurant industry grew like crazy. Well, all of those macro trends came to a halt around the year 2000. So it's been quite a long time ago, so this is nothing new. Uh, percentage of women in the workforce is not growing. Baby boomers are actually exiting career and family life stage. They're being replaced by a generation that has a different set of values and is doing it differently. They still need their convenience. Okay, millennials today are eating at restaurants more than anybody else. They're doing so at a rate substantially less than previous generations at that peak. And so as they eat at home, they look for convenience in the home, but not necessarily in the form of processed food or shortcuts in the food. Uh, so they're looking in convenience in how we procure the food. So a boxed meal kit or buying it online or uh, convenience in how we prepare the food. So one of the hot selling items right now is this thing called the Instapot or a multi-cooker. You know, it's a... Uh, you, you, you we might have actually, one. 
Yeah, and you might actually be cooking for eight or nine hours, but it only took you about 10 minutes to load the thing up. So that's a convenience proposition right there. So uh, people are accessing convenience more than just the traditional definitions of convenience. So one of the other um, trends I've heard we've talked about on the show a lot is, is eating healthier, eating in, um, organic, eating clean labeled food, right. clean food. Um, what are you seeing in, in terms of trends like that? There's no doubt that we are changing our eating patterns. Uh, there is a, an increasing value for, for health. It's really driven by uh, anybody under age 40. Uh, if you look at just as a surrogate for eating clean, if you look at fresh foods consumption. So think fruits, vegetables, perimeter of the store type items. Um, now we, we ate more fresh food in the 1980s than we do today. But remember we had this convenience foods revolution, right? And we've now gradually started swinging that pendulum back the other way again. So fresh food consumption is increasing. It's absolutely being driven by younger consumers. They're the ones that have brought in a new uh, era of food values. With that said, I'm convinced uh, that the data shows us that the consumer today defines health more broadly than in the past. So it's less than ever before about how many calories, how much fat was in the food, what's the cholesterol level. It's less and less about that, and it's more about a sense of total wellness and well-being. In other words, I want to feel good, and I want to feel good about the food that I'm eating. Now, within that construct... I can make room for some indulgent eating occasions so I can have my ice cream, I can have my craft beer from the convenience store, and I can do so in a compartmentalized way that fits into this total, very personalized definition of wellness. So what, you're, what I'm hearing, and one of the things I used to think is channel blurring is really because all retailers need to f be alike because, well, why not if they can? But channel blurring, what I'm hearing, might be more defined by the customer in that Today, somebody will say, I'm going out to a restaurant, and it could be a convenience store. It could be some other type of store, but it might, not, it might be entirely different than what their parents might call a restaurant. A restaurant is not necessarily tablecloth. The consumer is not sitting at home worrying about channel blurring. They don't even think in those terms. They think, I'm hungry. What are my solutions? And what are the ways that people can meet that solution? So let me give you an example. In, at dinner tonight, all across America, at people's homes, in their, in their dining room table, one out of ten of the entrees are going to be sourced, prepared, ready to eat from food service. Now, that might have come from a convenience store. It might have come from a supermarket. It might have come from a traditional restaurant. And that, that entree will be paired with other items that may have been completely or partially homemade. Maybe it was a salad. Maybe it was a box of macaroni and cheese. And so I think uh, food and beverage companies need to start thinking about this concept of a blended meal. It's not, it's not just so much of whether we cook something at home or whether we go out. It's really about what's the food solution and where can I fit on that plate, whether it's prepared, ready to eat, whether it comes packaged uh, from a retail store. How do we craft a solution that makes sense to the consumer? One in ten. That's uh, I, we do that in my house too. I have I have two kids, and so you know we'll buy the pizza, but we make the vegetables that go with it, and I I guess I fit in there. Um, so another opportunity that we've looked at a lot, and we've talked Jeff and I have talked about, is where convenience stores grow is with breakfast, because I think something that convenience stores offer is is a lot of prepared meals, but also snacks on the go. And I, I think we find with millennials love to snack. They hate to prepare things like cereal and milk because that's hard, apparently. Hard. Yeah. Um, I guess we could pre-do that for them at convenience stores, but that's just you know, weird. Cereal is still the number one thing <laughs> that Americans will eat at breakfast, but far and away, it's the number one thing. 20 years from now, cereal will still be the number one thing that we eat at breakfast, but it's been declining for 20 years and it's going to continue to gradually decline because we've proliferated all these other great choices like breakfast sandwiches that I can get at the local Local convenience store, and and I would I would tell you this: that breakfast sandwich is one of the fastest increasing items in our total uh, consumption behavior. And and why I think that is is let's think about what that breakfast sandwich can do for you. It's incredibly flexible. It's a it's a small portion. It's a relatively low price point. It's portable. So I have a tremendous amount of flexibility whether I want to have 
a breakfast and I get the sandwich and I pair it with other items or whether I just want to have a little snack in the afternoon or whether, you know, I need to eat it in the car on the way with me or whether I want to sit down and, and take a little break. So it's a tremendous amount of flexibility around that breakfast occasion that's fulfilled in that one little breakfast sandwich. It's got some protein in it. You know, it's it's uh, it's satisfying. Uh, if I'm really hungry, it doesn't cost a lot. Maybe I get two breakfast sandwiches. So I think it is... is um, Retailers and their manufacturer partners think about that kind of flexibility in food items, and it's, whether it's around breakfast or really any occasion, I think you'll see those kind of things continue to be successful. And, and we're not talking to somebody that just wrote an article about food. We're talking to somebody who puts together a 500-page opus every year that goes through <laughs> eating patterns in America, that dives into all the aspects of what goes on in food. Yes, uh, we're, we're for, it's informed by uh, multiple very large-scale uh, syndicated uh, databases that have been around for a long, long time. So I'm fortunate to have access to all that great stuff. So it's, it's called Eating Patterns in America, right? Correct. And, and I think a lot of people focus on what people buy. Do you also focus on how people consume what they buy? Yeah, Is it that's, eating in cars? Is it eating with each other or eating alone? What are the patterns I, Our main emerge? focus is really on the consumption, not on the purchase. There are a lot of other great uh, companies that do wonderful work tracking what people buy. Uh, we really are, are focused on what do people consume. And, uh, you know, it, as I alluded to before, the big trend today is we want to eat at home. Uh, 49% of dinners purchased from a restaurant today are consumed at home. We don't go out to eat. We go in to eat. <laughs> uh, we want to eat at home. Look, we're working from home more. Uh, we're getting, how many, are you streaming something on Netflix right now? You're oh, binge watching mm-hmm. something? Yeah, Lots. perhaps. So everybody's <laughs> getting their entertainment at home. If, if you look at the, the rate of sales of connected devices, streaming content devices, smart TVs, um, the online shopping. So there's no doubt that we're shopping at home more. We're working from home more. We're getting our entertainment from home more. We're going to eat at home more. Would that include like drone deliveries of food? It could, maybe so. <laughs> and you know, and that's the other thing that I would challenge convenience retailers to think about is, look, you're, yes, your core value is always going to be that fantastic location on the corner and you're very convenient. But you know what? There's still one more step of convenience, and that's getting it right to the consumer's front door. And, and you know, there's going to be a convenience store retailer out there that plays in that space. And, and the thing is, you don't have to, thinking about what you were talking about earlier, Bloomingdale's having a bar. I, I, I kind of latched onto that a little bit. I'm kind of <laughs> sad that that's only in the men's room. Why well, is that? Well, not What's in the that? men's room. It, it may men's not, it may, department, men's there's well, a difference. Maybe it's Nordstrom. Maybe it's... I can't remember who it is. <laughs> Somebody told me there was a bar in the men's department. But, but <laughs> what, what I, the point there is convenience stores generally don't sell clothing. But here's an idea from a clothing store that might have real legs in thinking about how you go to market. Uh, men generally don't like shopping. You can probably outline various reasons um, because it's only 20 years old. I don't need it. You know, that kind of thing. Right. What gets them going into a store? Maybe a bar. So think about what is the application for a convenience store? What is stopping a customer from going there? Maybe it's thinking outside the box. It doesn't mean putting in a bar, but think about what would get them to stop saying, I don't want to do it, but I want to do it. It's, it's the experience. Um, you know, I, I talked before about $1.8 trillion of consumer spend that's, that's actually declining. Um, the, the truth is most of that dollar volume represents the acquisition of material goods. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're evolving into an economy that is less about acquiring stuff and more about experiencing things and creating memories. So uh, sporting events and entertainment and um, travel uh, personal services like day spas, those kind of things people are spending on right now. So you know, for the traditional retailer, how do we make that shopping trip more of an experience? And I think that's why you see traditional grocery stores moving more into prepared foods, by the way, because what's more experiential than food, right? Um, so I, I, that's the other thing that I would encourage people to think about. And it really does come down to experience and, and thinking about eating out isn't really at eating out, it's eating in, but it's cooking out and just all these shifts. It, and before the one thing that it takes 10 years to be an overnight success, it, 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 there's those incremental things that happen along the way. 
What are some things that you're seeing as incremental things that maybe people don't see across the country, but they're starting to happen in whether it's California or East Coast, just something that is not big enough for, let's talk about it in the newspaper, but it's, a, it's emerging. Oh, wow, that's a great question. You know, uh, I mean, we could talk about, um, we, we've already discussed e-commerce in, in food, which is very small compared to a category like electronics, where 30% of the business uh, is online now. Uh, but that's not necessarily incremental. I mean, it's growing by leaps and bounds. Uh, we, we now see 7% of consumers in the past 30 days have purchased groceries online. And that includes uh, fresh. Uh, that's up from 5% a year ago. So it's already you know, increased roughly uh, 20% or so. So that's coming. Uh, somebody asked me the other day what I think the tipping point on that is. I said, we're, we're at it. It's going to accelerate quickly. Uh, food is not ever going to be something like electronics where 30% of the business is online because, uh, especially with fresh categories, we still want to see, feel, smell the fruit and the, those kind of things. Um, but what if it gets to 15%? Mm-hmm. You know, then the, the, the retail food and beverage universe would look very, very different uh, than it does today. And, you know, Carolyn, one of the trends I saw, we were out in the Cool New Products area, and, and it's a representation of what you see in bigger trends on the show floor. It's a little bit more convenient for us right. to see quickly. One of the things we were struck by is the number of protein drinks, the meal solutions that are drinkable. We, we're Absolutely. seeing a lot of that. So. Is food is just as eating out is now eating in, is eating now drinking? Well, protein, I think, is, is one of the key things. And, and when we talk about uh, health and wellness, uh, one of the things that uh, roughly half of consumers acknowledge that they would like to add more of into their diet is protein. At the same time, they don't necessarily want more traditional center-of-the-plate animal protein. So uh, you're seeing things like... Uh, dairy alternatives or uh, animal protein alternatives, and a lot of those, yeah, come in beverage form. So um, that's, that's certainly a trend worth watching with relatively small behavior, uh, but we, we are seeing that increase. And I think one of the other trends that we also saw was um, the functional messaging on packaging. That's, right. that's less, you know, less of this and uh, you know, low calorie, low fat, low it, but instead it's, it's high in protein or it's high in this vitamin or good yeah. for energy. Or- so we're, we're totally transitioning away from trying to get rid of the negatives like, I, oh, it's got too much fat or, oh, it's got too much cholesterol. And we're thinking more in terms of, oh, this is good for my brain or this is good for... Uh, heart health, or this is good, you know, the functional attributes in foods. So it, we're, we're more concerned about what's good and less concerned about trying to cut back on what's negative. In fact, some of the stuff that we used to call negative, we don't even think of as negative anymore. In a lot of cases, uh, fat, if it's a naturally occurring fat in a food like, like uh, nuts, avocados. for example, or avocados, then man, that's healthy. That's health food now. Cook some avocado toast later. No. Oh. <laughs> it's a long story. That's, whole, a, that's a podcast. Whole in grain. Itself. Toast. Whole grain toast, yes. yes. <laughs> so uh, as as food becomes drinks, can drinks become food? Can we have chewy beer and things like that? Oh, my goodness. Oh. You know, I get I get, uh, I get get calls all the time from, from all kinds of uh, crazy uh, food. There was some something like uh, there was some kind of ice cream or something that popped in your mouth or something like that. I can't remember, even remember what it was. What I always come back to is this. Look, uh, our, our eating habits actually change very, very slowly. Remember what I said about cereal? Mm-hmm. Uh, cereal has been declining for 20 years. It's still the number one thing that we eat at breakfast. Number one thing we buy at a restaurant at lunch, hamburger. It's not necessarily growing, but it's always going to be a hamburger. Now, what that hamburger looks like is going to change dramatically. You know, we're getting all kinds of craft burgers, all kinds of elevated forms of the hamburger, right? So in terms of these innovative, creative food ideas, what I would stick to is what are the big things? What are the things that we already eat every day? And then figure out how to put a twist on it. Figure out how to make it fun, how to make it better quality, or have some better for you attributes to it, or some different flavor profiles. Uh, And if that means, you know, chewy beer uh, <laughs> th- th- <laughs> so be it but uh, let's, let's talk about that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well it's also for retailers it's standing out it's differentiating yourself from the guy next door that's right and being that location that people just want to flock towards because um, there may be last mile delivery there may be something else but convenience stores have people in them someone to talk to and you can get it what it, when you want it what you want and get out quick and it, that's a challenge too we talked I talked with a lot of retailers uh, yesterday about this it's, you have to find the right balance of doing those things, but not forsake that core. 
Because that core is still, I mean, we're talking about all this disruption, all these things that are happening that's still on the margin. At the end of the day, uh, the core convenience store value proposition and the things that that heavy convenience store shopper comes into the store for, those are still going to be there. Those are not going to change. We're talking about how to enhance what we're doing to add growth on the perimeter. So you can't ever get away too far from, from that you know, core expertise. What's great about the NAC show is you see all these great, great, great products on the expo floor, but you also hear from really great thought leaders in Absolutely. the industry, like you. And tell us how we can learn more about eating patterns in America, and just for those that want to dive in deeper. Uh, NPD.com. Check us out. And download that 500 pages or figure <laughs> out how to get it? Well, you might have to write us a check first, but yeah. <laughs> well, I'm sure you'll make it convenient. That's right. Well, well, thank you once again, David. And Thank um, you for listening to Convenience hey, Matters. My pleasure. I enjoyed this very much. Thank you. You've been listening to Convenience Matters, brought to you by Nax. For more information, go to naxonline.com. <laughs>